from a flightless simulator at Ferris Air to a momentous meeting in an alley to the complex mind of an architect to every far sector in space and to the brilliance of the central power battery on OA. This is the podcast that covers the adventures of all of your favorite ring slingers. This is the Emerald Echo with your hosts, Adam and the Emerald Enthusiast. Welcome to another episode of the Emerald Echo podcast and vidcast. As always, I'm your host, Adam. And with me is my co-host, the Emerald Enthusiast himself, Donnie. Donnie, how's it going? Hey, what's up, Lantern fans? It's the man whose ring runs on fanboy energy. It is the Emerald Enthusiast, and we're here to talk about Green Lantern Circle of Fire. Now, Donnie, you, uh, you, you, we, when, we, when we started talking about you know, this, is a very special episode, folks, and I'm going to let Donnie explain it, but I just want to comment on how special it is because Donnie's got a tie on, and he didn't inform me of the dress code, uh, and so I just don't have a tie on. No, I think it's perfect. It's another Green Lantern Flash team up. How about yeah. that? <laughs> um, sounds good. Speaking of team ups, we are we are part of a a, a shared experience with this episode of the podcast. Mm-hmm. So why don't you tell our uh, viewers and listeners about what's going on? Okay, so Green Lantern Circle of Fire. What we're going to do is this is part of an interconnecting series of episodes. You need to listen to the Lantern cast, their episode on Green Lantern Circle of Fire, as well as the blog of Oa, then this episode, and then Mosaic Comics, and he will kind of finish everything up, including the Impulse epilogue. So that is where we are with this, and this takes place in the year 2000. Oh. Yes. Yes. Back, back, back in the good old days. Uh, back in the good, very, very long ago. It seemed, it doesn't seem that no, long ago to me, but it is, you know, 23 it's, it's years. 23 years ago now. Oh, boy. I was so young back then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, yeah, this is exciting because, uh, you know, for me, this is the uh, obviously being, you know, collaborating with those other, other uh, fantastic. Uh, Green Lantern uh, podcast is always always uh, a fun experience, um, and uh, but just in terms of of this this event, it's the first time I'm reading it. Okay, actually, so it's it's a new experience for me. Um, but uh, yeah, so let's let's give uh, the audience a, a little bit of a, a sort of background on the issues we're covering. Okay. All right, so the issues that we were we are covering here specifically, we are covering Green Lantern and the Atom, as well as Green Lantern and Green Lantern. And you will understand more about that if you've never read this story before. As we go on, you'll understand what that means. Right. And uh, if you want a bit, a bit of a funny moment, so when I agreed to do this podcast and I asked Adam and we said, okay, it's a go. I was like, all right, I'll go ahead, and I have DC Universe Infinite, and I was like, I will, because I love this story, I knew it well, but I was going to go back and take down notes on the finer points. So I went to the DC Universe Infinite site. You can only get it there if you have Ultra, which I haven't done yet. So Mm. I was like, okay, no problem. I know I have this in trade paperback. The problem is I couldn't find my trade paperback. I went through about eight different boxes. So I was like, all right, well, then single issues it is. (laughs) So I had to, I, I came across these first and I was like, well, I'll just use all these. So all right, I found them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, That's where we are. And so these are the two issues that we are dealing with today. And if you're listening to this on another platform, obviously you won't be able to see these comics. We have Green Lantern and the Atom, mm-hmm. as well as Green Lantern and Green Lantern. Yeah, both cover. I, I love both covers, by the way. Both. And I will have a word to say at the very end of this on my favorite cover. You have probably figured it out already, Adam. But we'll just we'll save that for the end. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't shock me if I if I guessed correctly. But maybe I'll yep. guess. I'll guess after, like when we get there, I'll, I'll have a stab at which one I think. Yeah. You mean of the two we're doing, or of the four? Of all of them, I'll show okay, you the one I, I like the best. Then I don't know if I have. It's the one with Nord on it. Oh, actually, he's not on it. <laughs> of course, yeah. <laughs> That's the Come only on, James thing. Got, James got a Nord Christmas special just for Donnie. Let's go. Let's do it. <laughs> for the Green Lantern fans, I would make sure that I covered that. 
as objectively I for, as I would force you to cover it regardless of whether you wanted to or not. I'll, as objectively as possible, I, I, I would be as positive as possible. Probably holding down a little bit of vomit, but I you know, no, I mean I don't hate North <laughs> that much. But anyway, um, <laughs> back, back to the task at hand. Before we talk about any more bodily fluids, yeah. So, um, just real quick, what was your first just impressions when you started to read this for the first time? Well, I, I thought the, uh, the the in terms of reading the whole because I read it all as one story. Just the idea of this villain Oblivion, uh, having not had exposure uh, to him or or it, um, I was intrigued. Uh, visually, he looked, you know, uh, uh, empowering, imposing. Um, the also the idea that, that that is sort of you know the initial conceit. One of the things that hooked me about this story right off the bat uh, was seeing. Um, Kyle and John drawing a comic book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Cause that's the, the whole meta aspect of it all. Yeah. Like drawing a comic within a comic. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, they mention on uh, the lantern cast about how much concentration it would take. Kyle is doing one thing and yet he has that construct desk that John is working on. Right. Yeah. So um, he's obviously come farther, you know, at this point than, you know, as far as using the ring and being able to master multiple tasks. But that's part of what this story deals with here. Yeah, so that was really cool. Like, I like that conceit that they were just to see them both drawing a comic was pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and, um, but yeah, the whole idea of the idea of Obsidian and, and the, the, the sort of um, this collection of, at the time, mm-hmm. Green Lanterns, yeah. Coming to get, coming together uh, from from different you know uh, uh, dimensions uni- yes. dimensions universes mm-hmm. etc cetera, etc cetera. yes you know I'm I'm fascinated by all that all that mm-hmm. stuff so anytime you put all that in the story it's uh, it uh, it hooks me quite easily yeah and I like. I don't want to give away the big reveal about the lanterns or oblivion, oblivion yeah, that, here. That's but that's not our job. <laughs> that's not our job. That that will be a, that will be you know the the cleanup batter, so to speak, is going to be Dan Kurtzke over at Mosaic Comics. Yeah, he'll do a good job of that. We've had him on the show before. He's, oh, we 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 love that guy. He's top tier. He's, he's, yeah, he's, he is. His, his his YouTube channel is amazing. He was amazing on the Lantern Cast when he was part of that. He's one of the you know the OG Green Lantern podcaster. So yeah. definitely make sure you listen to those other podcasts as well as this one, obviously. And let me just say this too, before before we get into the story, there's more I want to say about a couple of characters that I don't want to say now because it will step on what Dan is doing. Yeah. So come back for the next episode after this. And there's some thoughts that I want to offer on a couple of those characters and how they might fit into the future of Green Lantern. Cool. Okay? Yeah. Okay, so travel back with us now to the year 2000. This is a pivotal point in Kyle's journey. Now, we're talking six years after the events of Emerald Twilight and what has been retroactively named a new dawn. And he has been on that journey for many years, interacting with people like Alan Scott, John Stewart, as well as the Justice League. He's a member of the Justice League at this point, but... He still kind of has that new guy vibe to him. He's still learning. His journey is a step-by-step experience. And he's about to take a very important step with this story. I agree, definitely. One of the things that that, uh, that I needed to point out here before we we talk about the issues that um, we're talking about specifically is that in the first one, Superman says something to Kyle that I thought was really important. And he says the line, stow the self-doubt. And we also see Batman give him a chilly reception at one point. You know, again, so, you know, which is kind of where they started, by the way. It, you know, it wasn't the easiest relationship, which is, you know, very appropriate for any Green Lantern and Batman. They always kind of had a, have a frenemy vibe going on. There's right. respect, but the, the way that they operate is very different. Agreed. So. This is something that is important. This particular story is, again, it's another step. It's another part of that puzzle, putting together Kyle being able to move from kind of the new guy to, you know, a full-fledged, you know, hero equal among 
the you know iconic heroes of DC. Absolutely. Um, uh, I'll say this was a very. There's a lot of character development for Kyle by the time this uh, you know story wraps up. Mm-hmm. Uh, without spoiling anything. Uh, and that was very well done. Uh, mm-hmm. This is, there is a lot of very deep things in this, like deep themes that I want to talk about. Yeah. So let's get into it. Uh, first of all, we see that Kyle is with a new set of Green Lanterns, and these Green Lanterns appeared in Circle of Fire number one through various wormholes. Now, there are clues to what's going on here throughout the entire you know, series of these books. Mm. Especially if you look at it in, re- in retrospect, you're like, oh, that's what that meant, and that's what that meant. Yeah, once it was all over, you, pick, you, 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 start you to, picked up what was going on. How right? didn't I see that? Like, right. How did they, right? like, how did they materialize? How did all of those lanterns suddenly materialize through wormholes in you know, uh, the, the JLA Watchtower? Yeah. You know, okay. So th- that was, you know, first I was like, you know, how did exactly did that happen? Again, the first time that I read this, which has been a number of years, I actually picked this up after it happened. I wasn't subscribed to this initially. And then I heard about it, went to a comic shop, bought all the issues together and read them all together. You know, what's um, funny. I can remember vividly the first time I read this. It was yesterday. <laughs> or two, day, two days ago. <laughs> yeah. It was like yesterday, as a matter of fact. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a long time. Do you remember, like, you know, what you looked like back then and so on yeah, and so yeah, forth? It's quite, quite similar, i got to tell you. There might have been one le- a little less white in my beard. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I had a lot less white in my beard back then. Uh, yeah, so. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot less white ago. in my beard five years ago. Anyway, yeah. so. All right. You're so again, lantern. You're a white lantern. This is the beard. Yeah, there you go. It's a construct. The white hair is a construct. <laughs> I <laughs> wish. Then I could undo it. But uh, anyway, so hopefully it looks good, really good by the time it all goes white. Right, yeah. So, all right. So we get Green Lantern and the Atom. We get Ray Palmer and Forrest and Hunter Rayner, who are descendants of Kyle Rayner in this different dimension. And they share Kyle's ring in the future, that his descendants... In where they come from, it's it's Kyle's descendants. They they are the only ones able to to operate the singular, still existing Green Lantern ring, which is supposedly his. Yes, which is supposedly his, and we see them change the throughout this this issue. We see both of them using the ring. I kind of like that on on a couple fronts because uh, the idea that they have to share it. The, and here's w- w- the two things: one, because I was just imagining. You know, imagine today, like, I, 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 let's say a teenager or a, a young kid having, let's say, a, a, a device, like for, you know, like the Green Lantern ring. That would be the equivalent of getting a kid today, like two cousins today, one tablet and saying, here, you have to take turns. <laughs> You know, you know what would happen today? I wouldn't absolutely. It would not fly, because <laughs> each one would have to have their own, and it's like, like, gee, how much has changed in twenty three years? Because I'm like, that would never fly today. Like, like the, the the two kids would be throwing a tantrum over which one gets to use the ring, and so that's just an indictment on on the, the youth of today, as as far as I'm concerned. But <laughs> the other cool aspect of it is it kind of me being a wrestling, me and you being wrestling fans, Donnie. I, I felt like everybody, like the, the two of them were making a hot tag every time one or the other one had to use it. You know what I mean? So I, I kind of enjoyed that aspect of it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's something quite unique. We don't have, we've never seen, at least to my knowledge up to this point, two Green Lanterns have to share one ring. Uh, there was a point where Hal gave Kyle his ring to use. And there's yeah. been other points, like actually, uh, Hal gave Barry his ring to use at one point. Yeah. Uh, remember, Green Lanterns, they can't, it, you know, it's their ring, their rules. So if they decide that someone else can use it, they can do that temporarily. Mm-hmm. But as far as this seems like it is one ring to both of them. And they talk about the Teen Lantern Corps in, in the future, which, by the way, sets off Ray Palmer, 
You know, he's like Doc Brown in Back to the Future. He's like, don't, don't, tell, me, <laughs> don't tell me about the future. So, uh, and I want to point this out. When they mention the Teen Lantern Corps, they're not talking about the other various characters who carry the moniker of Teen Lantern throughout DC history. Right, I was going to mention that because since then we've seen yeah. the, the concept revisited, right? Right. Now, they're not talking about Kelly Quintella or they're not talking about Ty Pham or Jordana Gardner. Yeah. All of these various characters or various versions of other Lanterns who have at one point or another in whatever Elseworld story or whatever been teenagers yes. with a uh, ring. Yeah. They're just talking about this particular <clears throat> Dimensions group in the future. Right. Yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah. So, Adam, by the way, is – and when I say Adam, I mean Ray Palmer, not this Adam. But, yeah. you know, you may have been the same way. He's really annoyed with the teenagers. Uh, well, I get annoyed with teenagers, <laughs> but not these two. My nephews sometimes annoy me, but yeah, <laughs> you know, that's a different that's a different thing. But yeah, yeah. So, um, all right. So this issue, what we see is that they decide that they're going to try to track down the villains that are the most likely to have been the one to to uh, be responsible for the appearance of Oblivion. Yeah. And that turns out to be the Scarecrow, Dr. Psycho, Dr. Light, and Professor Ivo. I did like how, you know, Ray Palmer uses his smarts and common sense to kind of whittle down the list of potential mm -hmm. potential candidates and how he gets it down to the four. You know what I mean? Yes. I thought, uh, like, it was important to show his, his uh, cleverness. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, anytime... Me being a huge Batman fan that I am, anytime you bring in a Batman role to a book, it always it piques my interest. And Scarecrow is one of the cooler ones, and so yeah. I, I liked seeing seeing him. Yeah, um, I also like how creepy uh, um, Professor Ivo was. Yeah, he, he yeah. is. He, yeah, how how creepily he was drawn. Yeah, but you bring up a good point here. This is actually, um, if I may, kind of a scholastic comic because there is a lot of various things in here like we see a construct of the scream which is a famous painting by edvard munch and we see discussion of the occam's razor mm. uh a quote from sherlock holmes there is a um at, at one point there is a it, it's not a construct it is uh something created by dr psycho uh there's a mention of schrodinger's cat and we also see um, Hunter use constructs of the characters from the book Little Women. Mm. So there's a lot of things that you have you have learned in school, hopefully if you're an adult or you're a teenager far enough along. These are things that may be familiar to you. Yeah, it's funny because when I, I heard some of that terminology, like Occam's Razor and Schrodinger's Cat, there's that gif. You know that gif of Leonardo DiCaprio pointing at the screen? Yeah, I yeah. Mean, yeah, that was me. I, was, yeah. I get that reference. Yeah. Yeah. I understood that reference. <laughs> yeah, and I thought, you know, that was really cool to use all of these things and fuse them in that way. Yeah. Um, that you know, that was really cool. And some it, of this, it, I guess, it adds it adds a layer of of, of rea reality, legitimacy, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll say this: this is different for me now as opposed to reading this twenty three years ago. I read this as a dad now and say, hey, you know, whether it was whether you're just getting the entertainment value out of this or you're reading this, maybe some kid reads this and is like, hmm, Occam's Razor. What is Occam's Razor? You know, yeah. Yeah. they boil it down to in here, you know, the the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. Now, that, that's an oversimplification of this philosophy. But it's, uh, again, it you know, they're discussing how do we problem solve here with the mystery of oblivion. Mm. So, and... All of the villains that they encounter ultimately prove to have no idea of who Oblivion is. Yeah. And, and I, I really like, what I really like is the way you know, the evolution of Ray Palmer being, being, you know, strict and stern and, you know, you can't go out on a mission, you're not ready for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and to, you know, to ultimately allowing these lanterns to play a part and also and 
working with them. Like he, there was a, the scene where he shrunk down and kind of like helped them defeat, you know, the various ones. Like that yeah. was, to me, to me, like it, it was just an evolution of the, their of the relationship that was being formed between Ray and the two Teen Lanterns. Mm-hmm. That I, I thought was important. It would have been a really boring issue if the entire time he was like, "No, stand back and let me do everything." You know what I mean? It would have been yeah. bo- really boring. So well, they are able to prove themselves to him in this issue, and they even call him out on it. They're like, "You know, we, you know, it's frustrating to be underestimated because of your age, and you have to be. You know, you were that age once, right, Professor? You were our age. You didn't like to be underestimated, and we right. don't like it either." No. And so they do work in tandem against these villains. Of course, you know, it's a comic book, so there's some battling, of course. And when the fights ensue, Forrest beats Scarecrow by making a construct of Batman. Uh, Hunter beats Dr. Psycho with constructs of the characters from Little Women. Mm -hmm. And then threatens them with uh, possibly characters from Jane Austen. (laughs) Which, again, I thought, again, these, you know, references from scholarly areas I thought was really cool. The Adam shrinks down what Adam was talking about, Adam as in Ray Palmer, and this Adam as in my co-host. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize this was going to be confusing. That would get confusing, yeah. <laughs> so Adam shrinks down and goes inside Professor Ivo's brain. And threatens to rewire it so he loses all of his intelligence <laughs> if he doesn't tell, tell him what he knows about Oblivion, which again, of course, turns out to be nothing. And we see that Dr. Light is still imprisoned in Kyle Rayner's battery, that happened at the end of Green Lantern 3D number one. So if you don't know how that happened, you've got to go back and read that one shot. Okay. Uh, the the cool thing about the the the, the, the Batman construct, we, we, first of all, the way it was drawn it was yes. pretty cool. Uh, but also when Ray Palmer was like, well, you know, Bruce does say that that they're the criminals are superstitious and cowardly a lot. Yeah. So it kind of gives them an idea of what to do for with Scarecrow, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I dug that. Um, I thought, um, you know, uh, to me, it was Dr. Which one was it? Do- Dr. Ivo, was it? Mm-hmm. What, initially takes credit or tries to take, say that he knows who uh, Obsidian, who created Obsidian, and, and uh, Oblivion, I should say, sorry. And uh, he he talks about, how, like, he takes credit for it. And it just shows you the ego of some of these villains. Like the, oh, right, yeah. You know, the, which I thought was cool, right? Whereas the rest of them, had, once they got threatened, were flat out denied it, but he tried to, you know, string them along as much as possible because he's like, well, if anybody could take out the Justice League, I'd want to take credit for that, right? Which Which is... Which makes sense. Yeah, and, and and the Adam believed him. He was like, "Yeah, you know what? That does make sense." Yeah, that tracks. Um, there, there's one problem I had with with this one shot and the one shots that led up to uh, the, the final issue, uh, or not even the final issue, but but that 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 led up to Green Lantern and Green Lantern, and, and that is that ending message from Kyle. Mm-hmm. Of hey, I found we found we found them, and he's here. He's on Oa, right? That kind of for me dilutes the rest of the issues because what's the point? Like you know what I mean? It kind of like defeats. Like you've sent off these groups, mm-hmm. these pairings to find out more about him, to find out how to stop him. But once the two Green Lanterns figure it out and find it, it kind of when you when you see that message in every issue, and the fact yes. that it was played in every issue, yes. kind of dilutes the the, the 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 overall purpose of those issues. You know what I mean? A little bit. I, I can see what you're saying. A lot of the these these issues, it's happening. The events are happening simultaneously, right? And so you can kind of look at it that way. As all of five of these are happening at once, it's one big trade paperback. Sandwich between issue number one and issue number two of Circle of Fire. What I personally would have liked is not to have that mm-hmm. message after every issue, but in the last Green Lantern and Green Lantern story. I think it would have been better served in just a one, appearing in the one. 
Uh, oh, so you're saying that, like they said they could have like ended it by saying, "Oh, here's a, you know here's a transmission from Kyle, and we don't know what yeah, that is until you pick up that, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. So that would be my only major criticism. Mm -hmm. And I thought the other thing. I mean, is there something specifically you wanted to mention, or or just no? Like, I'm I'm going to wrap up exactly where where we are with this issue, and then there's a couple things I want to say about the art a little yeah, bit. Too, okay. and, yeah. So wrap up where we are with the issue, and then we'll talk about the art real quick. Yeah. Okay, so the group ends up back at Kyle's apartment where they find a sketch of a character named Sir Nobleman who resembles the Emerald Knight who is part of the Green Lanterns that were summoned as part of this group. And this sketch of Sir Nobleman is in a notebook from Kyle's childhood. And the inference here is that Oblivion and Pell Tavern, a.k.a. The, the Emerald Knight, were created at the same time. And so here, that's that's another clue. That was to what's an interesting. Going on here. That was an interesting wrinkle because I thought, well, uh, you know, the Spectre, aka Hal, mm -hmm. at this point, warned Kyle that somebody close to him would betray him. So I'm like, well, the if if the Emerald Knight and Oblivion are connected, it, it's going to be Emerald Knight that betrays him. So I fell for the ruse that that mm -hmm. you know. Or the, or the inference that was presented here. Yeah. I fell for it. A <laughs> um, couple things I want to say. Number one about this issue, and then I want to say something because you, you brought up Hal as the Spectre. There's another quote in this issue where I believe it was Dr. Psycho. When he was interacting with Forrest and he said, your mind, it's all lies. Mm, it's an yeah. illusion. It's all lies. Looking back on that, that might have been the biggest clue in all of this as to what was going on. That's true, yeah. Um, and even though it's not part of the two issues that we have here, you brought up how, Jordan, I remember being actually kind of touched by when Kyle flew off and we see that the Spectre finally takes his hood off and it's Hal Jordan. Again, at this point, Hal Jordan is the Spectre. Again, we don't want to get too much into that, that time I'm here, but Hal is the Spectre. This takes place after Final Night. And... The look on Hal's face, the compassion for Kyle, I just thought was really cool to see that, you know, that he understands the gravity of this whole situation. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So um, just a couple, um, ish, a, a couple of issues that I took with the art. Um, some of the anatomy I thought was a little cartoonish. Yeah, that was my complaint too. Yes. Um, and the facial expressions too. Not that it wasn't good for some characters, but some of the the I thought the expressions were a little overdone, and the facial uh, the the um, like the the noses and the the, the other uh, you know aspects of the faces were a little again uh, just a little cartoonish for my taste. I would agree with that. Uh, that was my main issue as well. Now it, it really worked for some characters like Doctor Psycho. I thought it was it was a perfect right. meeting there. So yeah, absolutely, yeah. By the way, at the end of this, I'll make sure that in the description below we put a uh, we put the creative teams for these two books. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, sure. Regardless of you know whatever criticisms criticisms that we may have, I think we both like this. I know I love this story from start to finish. So, yeah, I mean, at, yeah. at the end of the day, look, you know, uh, with the, with art, it's a thing of you know everybody's a better artist than me because I can't draw. So if, when I <laughs> when I when I say when I critique art, it's 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 mainly because a particular style just doesn't appeal to me that much. And when things are too cartoonish, that tends to be the case. But the art is solid here. There's just elements where it looks a little bit wonky because it's too uh, cartoonish for me. But overall, a solid job. Um, so are we going to rate this um, with with my favorite image being, of course, the construct of Batman, obviously. Uh, that, but, <laughs> um, that Batman, that was, that was terrifying. <laughs> yeah. Um, but... So we're going to rate this on our normal uh, scale. The way that we yeah do the yeah. five for art and five, you know, out of five yeah. for and, art. And I, five maybe we'll do writing. each issue individually. So okay, let's do it that for way. this for this one. I'm going to give um, uh, a, a four uh, for the story mm -hmm. because I really liked the the relationship between. Ray and 
the, the kids and how that yes. evolved. Um, and I'm, and, the, and the, the only reason I'm knocking off a point, again, is because I think that message that they get from Kyle kind of de- diminishes the importance of the, the single issues themselves um, or, the, or the tie-in issues to the main event. Um, and then for the art, I'm going to give it a 3.5 out of 5. Uh, so for a, a total of uh, 7.5. Okay. I'm going to go 4.5 for the story. I thought it was really cool, especially, again, uh, interweaving all of those kind of scholastic themes into this. And the art, again, nothing wrong with it technically, just not my particular you know cup of tea. I'm going to give it a 3.5, much like Adam did. And again, very enjoyable. And it worked for a lot of characters in this. I thought there was a lot of great character development. And the way that we saw them progress towards the end of this issue, I thought it really worked. Agree. All right. So on to Green Lantern and Green Lantern. Yes. Okay. So this issue, by the way, was written by Judd Winnick, who would pick up and write a lot of Green Lantern Volume 3 after Ron Mars. He'd pick up with issue number 20, uh, issue number 129. And, um, He wrote a considerable part of Volume 3. And we see that in this story, one of the Green Lanterns, the most shocking Green Lantern that we see revealed of the group that comes through these wormholes, these portals, is Alexandra DeWitt. Or at least that that Dimensions version of Alexandra DeWitt. That that was a cool twist, I will say, when when they made that reveal. And I, and I like that, like, the first time you see her, it's in, like, her face is in the shadows. Yeah. And then she turns around, and you see her, you know, a full body shot, and she says, you know, that's who I am. And it's like, wow, you know. Yeah, you knew things were going to get uh, intense when that reveal happened. Um, um, By the way, I love all of these characters' designs, and... If I if I if I could wave a magic wand or for, no take that back if I had my own Green Lantern ring <laughs> wait before you say anything this is going to be about a figure go ahead you think you know me kind of like Edge uh, yeah, you well, you know and you do so yeah. <laughs> and you do I was going to say I would love a box set of the McFarland figures with all of these which I know won't happen but we might get Oblivion someday you never know because I think he's such a cool looking character you know there's there's kind of a description uh, should read i would like a box set dot 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 (laughs) and then i really like you know with oblivion you kind of get like a lord of the rings legend kind of vibe yeah it's a it's a badass design yeah yeah it's it's really cool um but yeah i would love a box set especially with the uh alexandra dewitt Oh, um, yeah, Green yeah. Lantern. I would love. It. Of course, you know, if I got a box set, it would probably be Kyle and Alexandra, Oblivion and Batman, for whatever uh, reason. <laughs> Alexandra, no, does would in in your hypothetical? I'm gonna get so chastised for this, but in a hypothetical box set, does it come with Kyle Rayner, Alexandra Dewitt, and a refrigerator? <laughs> you know, believe. <laughs> <laughs> We do see that in this issue. We see that. Right. I'm just yeah. saying, can you imagine a box set? <laughs> Wait a the gold label version would have a refrigerator yeah. in it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the gold label. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah, we're going to get some nasty feedback on that. But anyway. <laughs> Joke, folks. Come on. They did it, not us. We just, we're just commenting on it. Um, yeah, we actually we're, see. We're that- Martha again, just so we can. Why did you say that name? There we go. <laughs> we can divert the conversation. I was walking through an Ollie's the other day and saw like a cookbook by Martha Stewart. And it's just, without even thinking about it, why did you say that name? I'm sure everybody in the store was like, what is wrong with that guy? Um, <laughs> anyway, so, uh-huh. but what I want to say here is that Alexandra's backstory in this is that her, the story is inverted from what we saw with Kyle's first appearance. It's Kyle that ki- that gets killed by Major Force and stuffed in the refrigerator. Right, yeah. And Alexandra is the one who gets the ring from Ganthet. That's pretty awesome how they were just the inverted of each other. Yeah, I thought you know I thought that was really inventive. I thought it was really cool, and 
that led to a very emotional comic. It was. It was very, yeah. Like the fact that they were sort of um, explaining to each other how it's been and, and what it's been like for the other to deal with going forward. Yeah. And al almost like they were finishing each other's sentences just shows you how in love these two people were, right? Yeah. Um, and despite the fact that, you know, Kyle, you know, has serious, a serious relationship with Donna Troy mm -hmm. and eventually Jade, Emotions can be complicated when it comes to things like this. You often hear about, you know, older couples who maybe, you know, you were married for 40 years or whatever, and then a partner in the marriage dies. And maybe the, the surviving partner gets married, but they don't stop loving their old partner. Of course. You know, there, there's still, you know, the, there's a place for that, the, the first partner in their heart forever. Yeah, absolutely. And I think... Even though Kyle moves on, there's a part of his heart that is always committed to Alexandra. For sure. And um, in contrast to the first issue that we read, where there was a lot of complicated backgrounds and lots of different characters, this is almost exclusively, with the exceptions of the flashback and the very end where we see Oblivion, it's almost exclusively Kyle and Alexandra. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a very clean comic in the way that the art and the story is laid out. Yeah, it's very intimate to those two characters, as it should be. Yeah, um, and once you knew who she was, you knew that was going to be the pairing. Like, I didn't even have to see the issues to figure out that that was going to be the pairing. Um, but you know, in the midst of that, of the 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 deep emotional conversation they were having. There was also, you know, I thought it was well balanced by Judd Winnick with, with some of the fun of, you know, comparing the differences between yeah. the two universes. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, like music and food and things like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, again, very emotional, but at the same time, with with a through uh, a few little humorous themes thrown in here and there. Right. But I do want to point out one line in particular that I remember hit me. With, that it had so much truth in it. It's so authentic. Kyle talks about the worst part about her death is that when he wakes up in the morning, and his exact phrase here was, you die away from me all over again. He would wake up and, you know, forget what had happened momentarily. You know, when you're in that, you're, when you're in that, that place between sleep and wakefulness. Yeah. And he would wake up and remember what had happened. And he was like, it was like going through the death again. It's not entirely the same thing, but it's similar. I feel the same way the week after a Leafs playoff loss. <laughs> I just want to point that out. I thought you were getting ready to be serious, man. <laughs> oh, oh. And you know what's worse Ugh. is I wake up to a, a bedroom full of leaf crap. So, <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. In I times forgot. of trauma, I really need you around, man. Let me tell you. <laughs> uh, that's what I'm here for, to make people laugh. <laughs> but going back to what I was saying, I, I thought that there was an authenticity in this because yeah. w w whether it's a, you know, w it doesn't necessarily have to be a romantic relationship. When you lose a family member or a close friend, you, there will be times that you can momentarily forget that that person's gone. Yeah, yeah. And remembering it makes it happen all over again. Yeah. And absolutely. so th that line just hit me as so powerful when he said, it's like you died away from me all over again, like every morning. I mean, and it's true. It's like it could happen to you know a friend or, or with a friend. or Like I'll, I'll be open and honest about, about my experience. Uh, you know, I... I've said on this very show because he was the one that introduced me to Green Lantern. My friend Dave uh, passed away um, last summer now. And there are so many times where I'll be doing something throughout the day. And then typical to our routine would be at a certain time of day, I'd, I'd call Dave and, and get caught up on comics. So it's like, oh, I got to call Dave. And then I realize, oh, wait. I can't do that anymore. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, in all seriousness, I do understand that that sensation. Yeah. So, um, 
I'll say something and wrap it up here towards the end. As far as criticisms go, really my only criticism, again, is with the art. Um, I didn't like the visor look for Kyle's mask here. It was, it was, you could see like flesh around the eyes. Okay. And I don't know why, but that bothered me. Like it wasn't all part of his mat. Like it wasn't one singular crab mask. I also thought at different points, he wasn't, he wasn't drawn as big as he needed to be. The musculature was a little, it looked kind of teenagerish. Yeah. You know, I he, can see that. Yeah. He, he doesn't have to be a huge guy, but there are, there were panels that he looked like he weighed like 150 pounds. And I'm like, so you know, you're that saying he yeah. looked like the one, two, three kid? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Without the mullet. So, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, I, uh, the other thing I, I do um, want to mention is when they do the, when they do the, the, you know, when he records the message in this issue, this is where it should have been. This is the only place we should have seen it. I can see I can see your point of view there. I like the way that they tied it all together, but that you know we can disagree on things, yeah, you know. Um, and believe it or not, remain civil, people on Twitter. Uh, okay. Imagine, imagine <laughs> how that works. Unbelievable, eh? it's, it's really weird. Um, um yeah. but yeah, no. Overall, I, I really this was probably of the of the one shots. This was my favorite issue, for sure, hands down. You know, I've heard a lot of Green Lantern fans say that among among all of these. Uh, that um, that was their favorite one. Just seeing Kyle reunited, even though it wasn't his Alexandra. I, I won't spoil. I won't spoil anything, but I kind of wanted her to, uh, to stay around. Like I wish they had found a, uh, a loophole in, in in the in the multiverse so that these two could like just stay together and have each other. Well, between that and another character, make sure that you come back. Please subscribe to this channel. That's Multiverse Musings, the vidcast, available right here on YouTube and many other platforms. I, and Shame, people say I can't plug. be a romantic and don't, I don't like romantic couples in comics. I do. Yes. I, Clark and Lois, you know, and I think Alexander DeWitt and, Green, and Kyle Rayner should be together. That's my, you know, I'm not going to start a, a hashtag or, right. or, or anything like that. But. I have a little bit different view of that. There, there is somebody I'd like Kyle to reunite with. But again, come back on the next episode. Make yeah, sure you I'm, I'm, I'm interested to hear who that is. I'll hear it right after this because we're recording right. another one. So, <laughs> all of you. No, I'm kidding. But I'll, ha I'll have something to say. But like I said, I don't want to step on Dan's toes because of course. I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm a big guy. If, if I step on your toes, yeah, you're going to break his foot. So. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, don't um, know, I don't know how, you know, Paul So, I want to say – go ahead. I want to yeah, say uh, something – We'll go ahead and rate this, and then then I'll say something towards the end here. Okay, so my rating for this, if you don't mind, I'll go first this time. Yeah. Um, um, I'm going to rate the story for this a 4.5. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, just because I love the, the entire interaction between Kyle and Alexandra. And then for the arts, it's a 4.5. So... We're pretty close on this, too. I'm going to give the story a five. It was so emotional to see the two of them interacting again, even though this, again, not the Alexandra DeWitt that was killed by Major Force. And I'm going to give the art a 4.5. I actually did like the art. Other than those couple of aspects, I thought it was really cool. Very clean. Very good use of color. I love Alexandra DeWitt's design as Green Lantern. As well yeah. as the shot of Oblivion at the end, man. That was awesome. So... Oh yeah, that was that, that was probably the standout page. Mm -hmm. Was that reveal, you know? So, uh, just some final thoughts on these and this story overall. The reason why I think this story is important is that there's an emotional aspect to Kyle that is different than the other titular lanterns. And, and, and I mean specifically the ones who were there at this point, Guy and Hal and John. The difference here is that all of those characters are natural heroes. They're better able to compartmentalize their emotions and do what needs to be done. Yeah. Kyle had a huge journey just getting to that point to where they all, you know, where they were ready to get their ring and go be a hero. Remember, Kyle wasn't a hero by nature when we see him here. 
And we see that that had, and as you see the end of this, there's some negative consequences to that. But there's also another aspect of this that kind of even things out in the the look at Kyle Rayner's psyche and his journey as a hero. Right. And again, I don't w- want to give away too much, but this is the point where you start to see him again become more comfortable as a veteran hero. Uh, absolutely. And like I said, the thing is, growing up doesn't happen all at once. And we saw some really important events happen before the year 2000. But just like in real life, again, you grow up a little bit here and a little bit there. Various things happen, and that makes you the person you are. This is another very important step to Kyle becoming an equal among icons like Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman and Firestorm and the Atom and so on. Right. Um, and I'll say, you know me, uh, I mean, I think you and I share this commonality that we love the Green Lantern mythos as a whole. And would like to see many adventures of all the Green Lanterns and appreciate them all, in your case, except for Norton. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but, you know, of all of them, I think Kyle Rayner has the greatest hero's journey. Well, you know, Guy Gardner said in Green Lantern Corps, when Kyle dies in that story during Blackest Night, he, Guy says, you know, he refuses to let Kyle's ring leave him until yeah. Saronic Natu is able, uh, Saronic Natu and Miri, they're able to, you know, get Kyle's heart started again. Mm. And Guy says he's earned it more than any of us. Yeah. Because, again, he wasn't that natural hero. He didn't have that inclination. He had to journey towards that inclination of being a hero. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, so that brings this portion of this Fabulous Green Lantern. It said that one last thing. Again, my favorite cover. The oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. What okay. was your favorite cover? Okay, so it's this one. And this is the one. There's been two trade paperbacks, by the way. There was uh, there was one released a number of years ago. There was also one released in 2021. That you can read on DC Universe Infinite if you have Ultra. But I remember seeing this for the first time, and I thought, oh, man, this is beautiful. I'm like, I wonder who drew the... Oh, Banks. Of course it's beautiful. Shocking. <laughs> I should have known. I love, but, and this no, is the yeah, image is. they use, yeah, for the trade paperbacks. So it's a spectacular cover. Um, he, I, I got to get him to sign this too someday. So. He's fantastic. He's just such a, a fantastic artist. And look forward to having him back on our show. Yeah, uh, make, make sure you check his Twitter and Instagram. All the the stuff that he's he always posts. posting it's some really cool art. So. Oh man, it's so amazing. Yeah. So he's like, and I'm like, I want that. <laughs> I want that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but um, that brings our portion of this fantastic crossover uh, to a close. Again, and there's another uh, episode to come. And for that, you have to go uh, to uh, Dan and uh, Mosaic uh, Mosaic Comics to 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 to, uh, to see that and listen to that. So definitely go there. And thank you very much to the Lantern cast for including us in this. Yeah, uh, That is one of my favorite podcasts. I, I've listened to the Lantern cast and the blog of Oa for years. Again, yeah. obviously, I know Dan. I watch all of his videos on Mosaic Comics. He yeah. is amazing. And make sure you listen to all these. Subscribe to those. And again, if you're a Green Lantern fan, point people to Green Lantern podcasts. Make sure that you're helping people access Green Lantern yeah, content. It's, it's, Make sure you're an ambassador for this mythos. The the, the Green Lantern uh, podcasting community is pretty cool and pretty special. So uh, I'm I'm honored to be a part of uh, of this um, th- this special series of episodes. But our job is done, and uh, now uh, Dan will will finish it off strong. Uh, of that I have no doubt. Uh, but in the meantime, if you'd like to follow uh, either of us on social media, you can. Uh, Donnie, where do they track you down? You can find me on Twitter and TikTok as the Emerald Enthusiast. You can also find me on my YouTube channel. Other than this one, that's the Emerald Enthusiast, where I do lock, lots of product reviews, including like the ones you see behind me here, although it is dark, but lots of Green Lantern product reviews. Awesome. 
And if you want to follow me, it's at Adam underscore least fan on Twitter. We have the, let uh, there be light. There you go. <laughs> uh, the podcast network has its own Twitter at MMNPDC. We have a Facebook group, uh, which the link to that is posted in the description below. Click that. I will add you and we can continue the conversation there. If you so choose, but until next time, remember, and happy Father's Day. This will probably be out the day after Father's Day, That's but we right. hope happy that Father's Day yeah. to all uh, uh, the fathers out there. Uh, mm -hmm. who listen to this part. We hope you get uh, fantastic uh, Green Lantern or DC Comics memorabilia for your special day. But until next time, remember that Green Lantern Circle of Fire is forever. From the first podcast covering this fantastic story. To the last. So long, everybody. So long, everyone. <laughs>